will be in ballroom B. Um, please check your programs. There were a couple of late additions, in particular the Ithaca presentation that's described here with Kelly Lack and Tom Nigren. Uh, that was a late addition. What else? I think that's it for announcements. Feel free to shout up anything I'm missing. Okay. I will go ahead and introduce our chancellor who will be joining us here virtually today. A nationally recognized leader in education, Dr. Nancy Zimper is SUNY's greatest champion. On June 1, 2009, Dr. Zimper became the 12th Chancellor of the State University of New York, bringing to the post impressive scholarship and boundless enthusiasm for the possibilities of learning that have made her a national force in the areas of teacher preparation, urban education, and university community collaboration. Prior to SUNY, she held leadership positions at the University of Cincinnati, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and the College of Education at The Ohio State University. At each step in her career, she crafted and refined a vision of higher education that is inclusive, encourages innovation, and is rooted in addressing the most pressing needs of our nation. It's a vision that's come to SUNY in full bloom. Chancellor Zimfer hit the ground running at SUNY immediately launching a statewide tour of the system of the system's 64 campuses that became the starting point for a system-wide strategic plan, The Power of SUNY. The plan, developed in an unparalleled climate of collaboration among New York's college campuses and communities, is an ambitious blueprint for harnessing SUNY's potential to drive economic revitalization, create jobs, and build today's students into tomorrow's leaders. Please welcome SUNY Chancellor Nancy Zimfer by the magic of video. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you at the Conference on Instructional Technologies, even if by video, but you of all people should uh, appreciate and respect uh, that process. Last year I was there in person and some of you may recall that I was moving around the state on that day coming to Oneonta after several meetings and I remember calling and saying to Provost Lavalley, stall or slow it down but he didn't have to because you had lots of questions and it was a great exchange so thank you for inviting me again let me compliment Lisa Stevens on your leadership of Fact Squared how important that has been to all of us how gracious you have been and what a constant contributor you are to the issues that we uh, are working through at SUNY Central and with all the campuses uh, I want to thank Ken O'Brien and Tina Good for the support of the University Faculty Senate and the Faculty Council and Community Colleges, uh, to Carrie Hatch and to David LaValle for their support of this effort as well. I've been asked to give a bit of an update on what's happening with the power of SUNY, and it really resembles very closely what you see on the screen, which is an update I gave 
uh, in my State of the University address uh, for 2012, and so I thought I could follow that pathway and, and give you an update at the same time. Um, it's only the second annual State of the University address, and I wanted you to see that our chair, Carl McCall, was there to support our work, as does the entire SUNY Board of Trustees. And we began uh, the State of the University address by thanking a very important partner. I think it's fair to say that SUNY has found its champion in Governor Cuomo. We've had two great years of legislative action where Governor Cuomo has brought the legislature to the table in support of the State University of New York. Uh, we call this NY SUNY 2020. Uh, last year, an investment in our research universities. This year, a continued investment in, in all of our SUNY campuses who uh, will be invited to apply for additional funding. And then, of course, rational tuition and the tuition support we got this year uh, for the community colleges and uh, this wonderful concept called maintenance of efforts. So uh, I go back a little bit and say that uh, I think one of the reasons we have captured uh, the governor's attention is that we were ready for his leadership thanks to the charge I was given by the SUNY Board of Trustees. They didn't exactly tell me to go to all 64 of the campuses in 2009, but they certainly received the results, which was a major discussion about the role SUNY can play in the economic revitalization of the state. We used that as a working hypothesis for, hypothesis for um, our statewide conversations in the very first year I was at SUNY, and we were able to develop from those conversations this big, hairy, audacious goal, which you all know by now, that, that SUNY could be the economic engine for New York's revitalization and the enhancement of the quality of life of every citizen in our campus communities. So that evolved into the six big ideas, and all of the people present at this conference on instructional technologies have played a pivotal role in bringing these six ideas to life. So we continue to move forward with innovation and healthcare, uh, an energy smart New York, our education pipeline, vibrant communities, and SUNY in the globe. And uh, we've done that as we've launched the strategic plan. And uh, we've also added, very importantly, not only task forces, uh, that are guiding still today these six big ideas, but we had some transformative needs as well that are affecting our day-to-day -day work. Our ability to round up our technologies and our IT delivery systems to work on strategic enrollment management, to work on our commitment to um, online education, and I'll, I'll talk about some of these things later. Uh, so all together, we have a number of task forces, uh, including resource allocation, uh, that we are working with still today. But we've been talking a lot about this concept of systemness uh, and, uh, in fact, having some fun with it. Systemness is not in Webster's Dictionary. Systemness is not yet a term defined by Wikipedia, but we've, we've created our own uh, definition. We hope that someday it will get picked up by Wikipedia, but for now, it's what we often say, that at SUNY, the whole is greater than the sum of its 64 parts. Each of our campuses has its own identity, but together, we really represent something even more powerful than the power of our individual campuses. So hopefully, by thinking more about systemness, we can truly connect these dots and look at this map, this extraordinary map of the 10 regions as defined by the governor and the lieutenant governor and the campuses that exist within these 10 regions and more powerfully connect the work of our campuses within your region and across regions. So that's been an important uh, effort this past year. You, many of you have been involved in our 
campus showcases. We did 10 of them across the 10 regions where each and every campus was able to showcase the contributions you are making to the six big ideas of the power of SUNY. Uh, but moving systemness forward requires that we think very carefully about what systemness means. So we actually called this State of the University Address getting down to business. Not the kind of business that means we're going to become a corporation or we're going to try to mimic the work of corporations, but instead what Jim Collins said, what he meant when he was talking about greatness. He had to write a whole appendix to good to great to explain to the readership that greatness is not a principle of business or industry or corporations that that universities have not gone over to the dark side and, and sold out to corporate mentality, but rather that greatness requires a culture of discipline. So to create this culture of discipline, we came upon the idea of breaking out of the Iron Triangle. It wasn't a concept that I really knew much about before I heard Secretary Duncan talk about this concept prior to the day President Obama invited about a dozen leaders in higher education to come and talk about it. This is the notion that if we as universities can bring down our costs, increase our productivity, we will have more investment in access and completion. Algebraically, controlling costs plus increasing productivity ensures access and completion. So what at SUNY can we do to bring down our costs? Well, one of our approaches has been the creation of a process of shared services. Instead of every campus doing everything, what can we do together? Now, one uh, reflection of shared services is what's happening between Delhi and Cobleskill, where they are actually sharing administrative positions might be CFO, it might be Director of HR, it might be Director of Communications, or Director of Fundraising. In fact, right now, the President at SUNY Delhi is the officer in charge at Cobleskill, the ultimate in shared services. But we're looking at our regions, we're trying to be more efficient across campuses, across the state, and we have a, a relationship now with the state of New York and the Office of Government Services where we are participating in really big purchasing and procurement that actually will save millions of dollars, not only for the state but for SUNY. And our commitment over the next three years is to reduce our costs by 5%, take the money that we save and invest it hopefully upwards of $100 million in instruction and student services. We are also considering performance-based allocations that we would set aside some of our dollars to reward those things that matter most to us. Now, this little chart is familiar to you. We've been cutting, 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 but with rational tuition, now we have the opportunity to rebuild over the next five years the reduction in our degree programs and our courses and particularly our faculty positions and set aside a very small amount to incentivize uh, completion or research productivity uh, or gr enrollment growth. We're talking about this now and we have a team, the FAST team, led by Brian Huxley. I'm sure you have some representation here to help make these decisions. We're also really monitoring our progress across the six big ideas. We're using um, technology to help us uh, monitor and learn more. Uh, unfortunately, our technology is a little bit here and there. Our campuses all have different systems. We are working diligently to create some kind of a universal relationship between the the uh, enterprise systems that we are using so that we can really finally have the ability to collect data across our campuses, to use data to make decisions, evidence-based decision-making, which will require 
a considerable amount of IT integration. So that's kind of cost. Now let's look at productivity. One of the things that we, we know we need to do is to enhance the delivery system of our six big ideas, the power of SUNY, and our report cards so we're monitor, monitoring our success on all that matters to us to have a more competitive SUNY, to advance our diversity, and to advance our impact on the big ideas like healthcare and energy conservation that we say matter so much to SUNY and to New York. So that's one element of enhancing productivity. A second element enhance, in enhancing our productivity is our commitment to bringing down the need for remediation. Do not hear this as SUNY being unsympathetic to the needs of students who arrive at college not prepared to do college work. But we are absolutely confident that if we work more closely with our colleagues in elementary and secondary education, more students will come to college, college ready. This is what we're doing when we talk about the education pipeline, when we talk about our early college high schools, even using this roadmap when we talk about giving every student a better opportunity from cradle to career, serving their academic and their social needs. So increasing our productivity by increasing the success of students from high school to college to career, even starting at the cradle, is a big part of our strategy. And then uh, additionally, to increase our productivity, we have formed a task force around strategic enrollment management. We're working with the Department of Labor to tell us both statewide and regionally what jobs are avail available, what are the high need areas where we need to graduate more students, could be nursing, could be engineering. Uh, since President Obama was just here at nanoscale science and engineering, it is most likely in the areas of, of training more clean lab technicians. So our commitment is to organize the way we grow program capacity around the workforce needs of the state of New York, not only for business and industry, but for the nonprofit world as well, so that we take into account the employability and how we help students who major in the arts, sciences, and humanities, just as well as we take into account students who major in business or nursing, and make sure they have employability when they graduate. So the third base, really, of the Iron Triangle, if we can bring down our costs and increase our productivity, is around access and completion. So we are very committed to the seamless transfer of students from our 30 community colleges to our baccalaureate institutions. Now more than ever, access must be married to completion. We need more emphasis on completion in our two-year institutions and increased emphasis on completion in our baccalaureate institutions. Secondly, we've talked a lot about this concept of open SUNY. How is it that we can take our uh, existing commitment to distance learning, online learning, and really turn it into a, a major online capacity for the State University of New York? We have a lot of people interested in this idea, many of you in the audience. I'm pleased to say that Lisa Stevens is on the task force uh, on online education, which I am chairing. And let me say to you, as experts far beyond my knowledge, I am leading this conversation, not so much because I know the absolute answer, but because if we do have capacity with the SUNY Learning Network, with Empire State College, with, with many of our campuses who are doing online learning, with our uh, international online effort out of SUNY Global called COIL. How can we put all that together along with our social media capacity through our website 
to really be the most dynamic online learning uh, system in the country and be able to compete internationally. And then lastly, we've got to barrel down on completion. We've got to get more of our students uh, not only job ready, but make sure that if their goal is certification, licensure, associate degree, or baccalaureate degree completion, that we give them the opportunity that they've come to SUNY to achieve, and that is degree completion. Uh, I don't think anybody could say it better than David Leonhardt has. Uh, you know, in any society, the best bet that society can make is to educate more people and educate them better. In summary, I've laid out how SUNY intends to get down to business, how we can use the iron triangle of bringing down our costs and increasing our productivity to provide access and completion, to take the power of SUNY into the classroom and into the lives, the learning lives of all our students and our citizens in the state of New York. You've been more than patient. I think you've been a captive audience. Uh, I appreciate coming to you by video and I congratulate you on all the work you do to enhance the power of SUNY. Have a great conference and thank you so much. State of New York. You've been more than patient. I think you've been a captive audience. Uh, I appreciate coming to you by video and I congratulate you on all the work you do to enhance the power of SUNY. Have a great conference and thank you so much. It has been such a privilege to be a part of watching all of the dots connect back to the power of SUNY. And now I'd like to introduce our provost, Dr. David Lavalley, who has served as provost and senior vice chancellor for academic affairs of the SUNY system since September of 2009. Prior to his position as interim provost, he served for 10 years as provost and vice president for academic affairs at SUNY New Paltz and at the City College of New York for the previous five years. Dr. Lavalle has been an integral part of the Chancellor's Executive Leadership Team and has been an active participant in the State University's statewide strategic planning process. Now as Executive Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs and Provost, Dr. Lavalle is directly responsible for program review and assessment, student mobility, transfer and articulation, academic planning and analysis, student life, SUNY-wide recruiting and applications processing, university-wide programs, including EOP and EOCs, institutional diversity and educational opportunity programs, faculty development and award activities, and is liaison to the Board of Trustees Academic Affairs Committee. Wow. <laughs> Dr. Lavalli's research area was bioorganic chemistry, and he's been very active in national efforts in science education and development of chemistry curricula at the college and high school levels. I'd like to go a little off script for a moment and add that Provost Lavalli is very much a champion of Fact Squared. He clearly values the grassroots, nat grassroots nature of our organization as an increasingly relying on the advisory task groups to illuminate current instructional technology issues throughout SUNY. He's also been the guiding force behind the rollout of the new Innovation Instruction Technology Grants Program Initiative. Please join me in a very warm welcome to Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost David Lavalli. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, we have all been extremely fortunate for Lisa's leadership uh, in CIT and the FACT uh, task forces. Uh, this, this past year in particular, uh, we've seen these task forces uh, take on very important projects, and I, I really like the way that it's been done, where they have a goal, they meet the goal, we're going to say thank you to those task forces, and then we're going to have a whole bunch of new task forces. 
so that we can keep on making progress. And I think that, that that's a really wonderful uh, way to be doing things. And uh, soon, of course, we're going to be welcoming Janet Effie. Uh, and Janet, uh, I have gotten to know quite a bit because she's so active in the University of Faculty and Senate, and especially with our awards programs uh, and all those things. So I know that she's extremely well organized going to keep you guys all on task just like Lisa. <laughs> so that's terrific. And uh, so let's, uh, let's congratulate Lisa and welcome Janet. SUNY and remediation, all of these things really can benefit uh, from the proper use of instructional technology and, uh, and integrate various kinds of learning methods so that students have options in the way that they acquire information. <coughs> now, one of the things I want to start with, um, because it was somewhat, it may still be somewhat controversial, but um, is, the, is the change in what we're doing with what was the SCAP. And uh, you know, during this period, when we've been making the transition, uh, Mary Jo Orchek from Brockport and Judy uh, Minska from Buff State have been extremely helpful in making sure that the transition works out well. Uh, and besides that, of course, they've also been leading task groups and, uh, and really working with us on, on e-books and lots of other issues. But um, <clears throat> as many of you know, about two decades ago, uh, the Student Computer Access Program was begun because students were unfamiliar with technology, and the faculty were pretty unfamiliar with technology, and so there were lots of pilot programs. Uh, I know it was done differently on different campuses, so my, my point of reference is 10 years worth of program. The new policy may have been done slightly different at other campuses, but um, there we had, we had proposals every year, and they were for something that had not been tried before, and we would buy some equipment that a faculty member or two would use and see how it might work into their courses, and then, uh, and then try to in, uh, integrate that into their teaching. <coughs> now, as it turns out, um, some of our problems in instruction, as, as you can imagine, are because the students are too tied to their technology. They're, they're glancing at their iPhones on one side, and they've got their laptop on, open underneath, or their iPad open underneath their desk, and so on. Um, and sort of teaching them to connect to technology is a different uh, mode of operation now than it was. And so what, what we decided to do is to transition that program from individual campus allotments and distribution to a, uh, a pro proposal program in which we want to look at innovative approaches using instructional technology, hopefully that can be scared up, scaled up and can be shared so that the, it, it becomes more of a development and informational tool, something that we can learn about from each other so that we can have innovation we hope that spread throughout the entire system. And so we have uh, grants now that you've all, I think, uh, received information on, and we hope to take those results, and after a year or two, when we start really having some results from those projects, to publicize those and to make sure that everybody knows about the successes, and just as important, and this is something I, I, I always talk about, I guess, uh, <coughs> It's broken record for some reason, but you really have to learn from your failures. Now, I was addressing, I do this every year, but I address uh, valedictorians and salutatorians of the Mid Hudson region. And one of the lessons I always have to tell them about, because they've all had all A's, is that if you don't go to college and get some C's, you aren't trying hard enough. 
because you should really be finding something new. You got to test your limits. So maybe there's something you're not terrific at. You know? Well, we have to do that same thing. We have to try some of these innovations, and some of them aren't going to work. And then we can teach each other what not to do and which ways not to go. And that will be just as important, I think, as some of the successes because it will mean we're testing the boundaries and we're making sure that we find out just how far we can stretch some of these things. <clears throat> so um, one of the things that um, the chancellor just touched on a little bit when she was talking about the governor was the New York SUNY 2020 uh, program, which initially, you know, was uh, for just the four research centers. And now all campuses have the opportunity to participate. And the ground rules are basically that it does need to be collaborative, and that the money that is going to be dispersed is going to be capital funds. Now the good news for instructional technology is that capital funds is also equipment, and it can be construed to be software packages. So in other words, it's an infrastructure. It's an infrastructure that you're putting. So you're not paying people salaries, and you're not buying day-to-day -day supplies, disposable supplies. But these are, are things that you, um, <clears throat> you're going to be putting in place of a durable nature, a different kind of thing. And I think there's a place in the NYC 2020 for campuses to be thinking about major projects that might involve instructional technology. And we might, we might begin to think about that a little bit. We need to be collaborative. Um, we need to have ideas where, oh, this won't be hard for you guys. It's at least $5,000 a campus that participates. Uh, that's the minimum. And, um, you know, that you put things together that we can really demonstrate are going to help the state of New York. Now, I will say that a major focus of the governor, and we've been through a number of presentations now, we have to meet with the governor's staff and present these SUNY 2020 proposals first in camera with the board shop, where we, we try to say, is this going to fly? And then, you know, if it's not going to fly, we go back and with the campus, we revise it until we get it to the place where we can go in the red room and he can announce it to the television and radio <coughs> and whatever, uh, internet. So um, part of that in the governor's sense is that he wants to see that this is going to have that effect on the state that helps our economy. That's really a lot of what he's driving at. So the, the way that our, our students are ready to meet the workplace is going to be very important. But that's a very broad concept. And I think it can fit a lot of things into that basket. So it's just something to think about. Um, I did want to talk a bit about strategic enrollment management. For me, um, we have a uh, we had seven transformation teams, and now we have nine getting out of business. And between uh, Tim and Tina are here, between them and me in this room, and Sharon, you know, about eight of them. Um, Kerry Hatch has been uh, really taking the charge for the innovative instruction, along with uh, Beth Grinjord and Nancy Will Schiff and a few other people on the staff. But uh, we're involved in a lot of them. But this, this definitely is one of my favorite ones. I mean, I think. I think we've got a lot that we can do with completion and success. I think that's going to be great. But it's sort of laid out. You know, there's a lot of strategies that people have already used. If we just adopt them, we could be more successful. We're in uh, pretty new ground with strategic role management. People haven't tried this very much. And there are some labor economists that tell us to forget about it. We just can't predict it. So don't even get into it. However, um, there, is, there is predictive value. In my particular field is chemistry, and we've had a shortage of analytical chemists for the last 60 years. So I feel pretty safe in saying that five years from now, when a student graduates, they'll be able to get a good job if they go into analytical chemistry. Uh, that's the way it's been for a very long time. We know that the population is aging. We know that there are certain kinds of health careers that are going to be needed. Uh, we know that we need to have uh, students who are um, technologically literate. We don't know exactly what the technology is going to be, but they, they must be able to apply themselves. And we must have people who uh, have the critical thinking skills that they will be able to take on new challenges and help to 
meet people, meet organizations, and so on. So what we want to do with strategic enrollment management is first of all to try to find out two kinds of gaps that we have. One gap is in those kinds of things that could lead directly to professions. Where are the areas that we're really not meeting those needs and we, we don't have the programs to do? The second part is where are we not meeting the needs of <clears throat> the students' desires for certain types of programs so that we simply don't have them available for them, whether or not they lead directly to employment. And we're going to be using two kinds of data here. One is the Bureau of Labor Statistics and looking at it regionally. And some of that, is, if you look at SUNY Matters, there's a, a beginning in that regard. But you can see in each region where it is that we have big gaps and not producing enough students to meet those needs. And the second one, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at things like the um, admissions of our four-year schools for community college students and which areas are closed early so that students cannot get in? Where, where are those gaps? The students really don't have the opportunity because the four-year uh, school is closed by that point. So in some of these areas include business, for example, and some are in your regular liberal arts and sciences majors. <clears throat> so we need to see where those kinds of gaps are as well. And we're gonna approach this in a number of ways. One is we will have high needs funding which will help to get programs started for the first three years. We're using the uh, master plans that each campus developed for its facilities to see where we can put, where we can have those programs where it is not, where we have a reasonable chance of being able to have facilities expanded or even using uh, existing facilities to house them. Where we have faculties and staff that are in the same kind of area or an allied area so you know you're building on strengths and those kinds of things. And then to sustain the program, we need to change our enrollment funding formula so that the high needs areas in that formula get higher programmatic reimbursements so that once they start on a campus, the campus can sustain them. And so these are really important. Now when we look at the high needs areas, there's a very important piece that we're starting to work on that you will be involved in, I'm, I'm quite sure. And that is that as we looked at our academic majors and we, in the mobility project, found out which courses in the first two years are generally required all across SUNY and now guarantee them for students, we found that some of our campuses do not have those courses. They don't have the courses. So, if what we can do is provide students the ability to get two or three of the courses they might be missing at their home campus, they would be able to stay at that campus and get their AA or their AS degree and transfer with everything they need to really be right in the same place as students who started as freshmen. Now, I'll give an example that is probably unfamiliar to most people, but it, it's one that is an interesting one to think about, and that's hospitality management. Uh, a lot of, <clears throat> of students are now finding that when they graduate with those degrees, they've got a very good chance of getting a good job. I know this, of course, because one of my nephews, everyone knows I have such a huge family, that uh, but he, he graduated from Plattsburgh and is now an assistant manager of a very fine hotel in Washington, D.C., and they can't get their people. They really are looking for them. Well, we only have three of our campuses that offer that at the bachelor level. But we have quite a few community colleges that offer uh, parallel kinds of programs in culinary or various kinds of lodging management or tourism. Those courses at the community colleges rarely if ever have all six of the courses that will be accepted by the four-year schools. They have two of them, three of them, whatever. So if we can make available those other courses, and a student can take at least one or two of them, they'll be in better shape when they transfer to be right in sync with everybody else. And there's lots of other majors like that. You'd be surprised, even some very, very common majors, even like psychology, <coughs> that some of the smaller community colleges really don't have them. And if you look at hospitality management, that's true of the four-year schools. 
other than those three, no one else has them. And it turns out that we have a lot of traffic, a four-year to four-year transfer, in order to get to a major that is not offered on the first campus. Very common. Right now, we have more transfer, two-year to two-year, four-year to four-year, and four-year to two-year, than we have two-year to four-year. Okay? <clears throat> Over half now. It's been growing. It's been growing. A fifth of the new students each community college takes now are transfers from other community colleges. About 9% are transfers from four-year colleges to the community college. And about 16% of transfers <coughs> uh, are four-year to four-year. And that's usually because of a program, of trying to find the program that they want, or a personal problem, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, whatever they need to be. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Those are the things that happen. That's why, uh, you know, you don't want to have a 100% retention rate because you have some sad kids. So, you know. <laughs> so, there are reasons. Everyone agrees. Uh, I'd say one of the great things that uh, people don't really know at all, I mean, people are stunned at me, they don't believe it, <clears throat> but what our real graduation rate is in SUNY is really so much higher than our graduation rate for students who start at any one of our four-year schools and finish at any one of our four-year schools okay, is 73 percent. The national average is 52. We're at 73. We're 63 percent at the same school. We get another 10 percent by doing our four-year to four-year transfers. Okay. Our success rate for community colleges is about 44 percent. It's about 23 percent graduating, but we have another 21 percent who successfully transfer. So, you know, we've got a good base that we're starting from, and um, that's what makes it a little easier for us, actually, to achieve more in the future. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we're, I think, um, besides making courses available and figuring out good learning technologies to make sure those courses are successful, um, besides completing the major, another area is developmental education. We talk about <clears throat> this remediation situation. And what we see is that students who need more than one area of remediation have a very, very low probability of completing a two-year degree or a successful transfer. And a part of this is the complexity of getting through developmental education sequences, and a part of it is certainly the fact that students are very discouraged, that they think they did okay, they've got an 80 average from high school, and then they find out that they have one or two or maybe even three remedial tasks to, to deal with. Um, and part of the challenges, particularly in mathematics, is that our very often developmental sequences are designed to make up for any possible deficiency rather than specific areas in which a student is struggling. So I think if we can go to um, computer assisted, not, com not solely computer, I think the mentor is important, someone they can ask questions of and, and be guided. But um, to have those computer-assisted programs for <clears throat> developmental education, I think it could be a real plus. They've been done in some places, and I think we can learn from those and build on them. And what we've just learned from the Ithaca project, which you're going to hear about um, a little later, I think could have a significant impact. And that was we did a pilot along with the University of Maryland system and some other colleges. Uh, unfortunately, the, the course that we had to work with was not the best for us. It was the statistics course that's offered by the mathematics department. And what we pointed out and what Maryland system pointed out to the people who were running the project was that that's not a common course for us. The really common course is psychological statistics, business statistics, social statistics, the real stuff. And, um, a number of other kinds of statistics that are applied rather than the straight math statistics. But since Carnegie Mellon developed it, and every student at Carnegie Mellon has to take math statistics, that's what we had to deal with. Um, what, what we did do is we, we piloted this at a number of our campuses, community college and four year. And what we found is that the learning that the students gained was actually the same. It was, it was cut up in all kinds of ways by gender, by ethnicity, by um, income, every way you could do it. And in each one of those areas, the students performed very, very similar. Plus or minus, you know, you know, a 
a statistically irrelevant uh, margin. And it was quite amazing because we had such an array of students and institutions. So it does mean that I think that, that we can look at these areas, particularly ones that are normally taught by part-time faculty or teaching assistants rather than full-time tenure-track faculty, and zero in on a few of these courses. And I think developmental education is, is a, an area for sure, probably uh, pre-calculus and college algebra. There may be some other areas where this could really be a great advantage, where the students could <clears throat> not have to pay tuition, not use up their financial aid, um, and, and get and learn that material that they need so that they can really be successful. And we'll hear more about the editorial report later. I think it's quite an ambitious undertaking. And uh, they're really talking about making another two or three million dollars available for these next courses in order to get a very um, flexible platform so that we can do a number of different courses. It uses artificial intelligence, and you'll learn all about it. It's really a lot of fun, so make sure you go to that site. Um, and Open SUNY, you're going to hear about that on Thursday. A big piece of that is the SUNY Learning Commons. And what we're looking for there is to really get broad impact from the community. And an important part of that is to make sure that we can assure faculty that they own the materials that they develop um, and that we have really good rules and policies in place. Um, and the premise that we're working from is um, that <clears throat> unless the faculty member has voluntarily signed a contract to produce those materials for some specific purpose, that those are their materials to copyright and use. And so we, we really want to be able to, to share <clears throat> methods, to share content. Um, I know myself in teaching general chemistry, I have found that the ability to get lots of digitally uh, uh, available demonstrations for students so they can, they can actually do them on their screen like several times over so they can really see what's going on. Uh, one of the things I, I did learn myself a number of years ago uh, from a, a study of, of science teaching was that when you do those great demonstrations and you blow everything up and you make sounds and colors that the students have no idea what the concept was. They just like the boom and the colors. And uh, so you, you have to do it at least twice. So I used to always do the demonstration at the beginning of my lecture, do the lecture, and then I would do it again at the end. And um, you know, tell them at the end, forget the apparatus, forget the boom, this is why we're doing this. And it did work a lot better. Uh, it really did work a lot better. So I think the, the idea they can get it and try it themselves several times on the computer is also uh, a big plus. So I think we've got a lot that we want to do with each other so we can share our best methods. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to mention, I think, and I don't know, Carrie, if you're going to talk about this, but the, the Common Course Catalog for online instruction at some point? Okay. Well, one of the things that we, you know, need to do if we're going to have students be able to see what courses they might want uh, to get that might not be on their own campus is we need to have those courses available so they can see where they are and take them online. We've worked out a cross-registration policy so they won't have to spend more money to take it if they're fully registered, if they're a full-time student at, a, at their own campus. They'll be able to take the other course without paying any additional money, except maybe a, a course fee if that's there. Um, but we need then to have a really comprehensive catalog and we need to have it at least a couple semesters in advance. We need to work toward that. Not every course, but the courses that campuses are really sure of they're gonna do to put them out so that a student can plan. And then the bugbear, right, right, Ken? Is, is always that we should probably start our semesters within two or three days of each other so that student financial aid really works. Because if your ad drop period is done, you're done. You know, you, and you, you can't get in again and all that kind of thing. So um, it, it was fortuitous. Last fall, for the first time I think ever, 70% of our campuses Community college and four years started on the same day. Okay, uh, in the spring it was off by ten days. It was really pretty bad, but um, you know those kind of things would really help. The other thing we'd like to try to do with this open SUNY and and expanding online 
is to really expand the number of online full degrees that we have. We have very few in SUNY. You consider the number of different degree programs, I think it's 7,600, something like that. Um, we only have a couple of dozen, right? Terry, I think it's a couple of dozen full. Oh. Yeah, about 20 at the four-year level, a lot more at the associate level. Now, what, of course, is, is part of the problem that you have in mounting that if you're on a campus? You have to get everybody on the campus involved because you've got to do all the general education. You've got to, every, every department has to sign on for you to do an online degree. And they've all got to keep it up. You know, if, if a department drops the ball and the course isn't available, then the student's really in trouble. They've got to keep it going each semester. However, if you're a campus that has a particular, you know, this, I was going to use hospitality management again, it's probably not too great because you do need quite a bit of hands-on stuff. But if you do, do have a degree where you could legitimately do the, the 35 or 40 credits of the major online, and that could work for the discipline, if we had a way that, that the home campus that does the major, does the complete major, then is the one that confers the degree, and we can use SLN on steroids, <laughs> if we can use a ramped up SLN that has all this stuff available every semester, the student could complete their degree using courses from around SUNY. And maybe they could do it at Empire State, where they have a mentor and they're using these courses from around SUNY. We can think of a lot of ways this might happen. But it could allow us to offer a lot more in terms of online education, or even online assisted education, where you're at a campus for some portion of your degree in residency. The student might go for three semesters and be able to complete the rest of it online. So I think that that's another kind of thing we want to look at for open soon. So I got, I think I'm allowed five more minutes, right? Because I started 10 minutes late. Um, okay. If I'm allowed five more minutes, I'll take five minutes of questions. And uh, any, anyone, anyone have any questions you'd like to propose, or you just want to move on? That's fine. All right. I'll be around for a while at lunch. I think we're going to have a working lunch. There'll be some things that we can do during that period. Uh, but right now, what I'd like to do is <clears throat> acknowledge uh, Ken O'Brien and Tina Good, the president of the University Faculty Senate and of the Faculty Council on Community Colleges, uh, respectfully, uh, for their support. And I think they might want to come up and say hello. Writing. When do you use writing? When do you not use writing? What is authorship? 
Who gets to write? Who should be writing? Who has access to it? Who shouldn't have access to it? All of these kinds of questions have been happening, and now I think we come into a whole other sense. We're rethinking authorship. We're rethinking how we think. There are arguments that have said that, you know, before writing, there was no such thing as analysis. After writing, there's no such thing as memory. I don't know. These are all things that we're dealing with again today. I want to encourage you to think not in ways of controlling, but in ways of using it. Provost LaValle was just talking about how to use it in remediation as it, as it applies to mathematics. What we have found in scholarship in the teaching and writing is that, especially in areas of remediation, technology is a wonder tool for teaching writing, particularly for those with tactile learning styles. So there's so much possibility here, but we have to work together, we have to work through faculty governance and work through all of those ideas as we put all this together. Because can you imagine trying to teach without the idea of writing and literacy? Can you imagine what we, those, those, those categories are, are just completely foreign to us. So will it be with this kind of technology. Thanks so much for coming today. At the risk of, of having what Janet Nepke de described, only not in this exact language, the virtual hook that would come and take us away if we went over a uh, hello, thank you, and wonderful to be here, uh, I have a very brief statement. Uh, I'm a cultural historian by trade. I probably began not with the dawn of email, but with the death of the quill. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, as such, I, I'm a practitioner of what one of our former academic vice presidents sneeringly referred to as the chalkboard discipline, uh, meaning that others could get money to which we would not have access. But one of the pieces I learned from studying institutions over time is their extraordinary staying power. And we often refer to revolutions before we look at the kind of continuities that continue through human organization and patterns of behavior uh, through this kind of revolutionary period and emerge in the other side almost intact. Well, I, I finally become convinced we are facing a tidal wave of change in the way in which we research, the way in which we communicate our research, the way in which we teach our students or one another. I'm not sure where that's going to lead us. I'm not sure what it's going to mean. But I have an appeal to all of you. Help us. Help SUNY faculty and professional staff think as clearly and as imaginatively as possible about the implications of teaching technologies as they become available, about distance learning with an absolute insistence on the learning, not necessarily on the distance, about the new world that might decide to assess learning by evaluation rather than degree attainment. In other words, help us face the potential revolution in higher education that both threatens our traditional methods of education and promises, promises a more personal, more student-centered, and more effective educational experience. You are the core throughout this system. We need you both to help us in the Senate figure out how this will be, this challenge will most effectively be met. We need you to take the leadership on your campuses on each of those 64 campuses to assist us as campus communities and as the SUNY system to move forward and meet our absolute responsibility for the highest quality public education this state can offer. Thank you very much. Meritorious Service Award, Lisa Stevens. And as Lisa comes up, I'll, I'll read it to you. 
the Meritorious Service Award to Dr. Lisa Stevens in recognition of her dedication and leadership to SUNY FACT II Council. It is with our deepest gratitude for her ongoing commitment to excellence in public higher education we present this award May 30th, 2012, Stony Brook University, signed by Nancy Zimfer and myself. Don't forget to visit with our vendors this evening. Mark McBride worked really hard to get them all.